The other procoagulant or gain of function abnormality is the prothrombin 20210A uh, mutation. And if you look at the prothrombin gene, the coding regions are in black, the non-coding regions are in blue. Way down here at the three prime non-coding region at, at base 20210, a G to A transposition occurs. And this was uh, described by Port in the Netherlands. And interestingly, this does not result in an abnormal protein. The prothrombin that's formed is an absolutely normal amino acid structure. What is abnormal here is this is in a regulatory area of the gene, and you wind up with increased production of prothrombin. So in general, these individuals will have higher prothrombin levels and increased thrombin activity on that basis. Uh, the prevalence of this is a little bit lower. It's about 1% to 2%. And in patients with a first DVT, unlike factor V Leiden, that was about 20%. This is about 6% and familial thrombophilia down around 18%. And as I mentioned, it's usually associated with an elevated prothrombin level, but the thrombophilic risk appears to look epidemiologically better connected to the presence of the mutation than the level of the prothrombin. That's why in, in laboratories we tend to screen for the mutation, not for prothrombin levels in these individuals. So the risk for thrombosis is about threefold increased um, in the heterozygotes. So those are increased function abnormalities that we'd be talking about. Other things that can tip the hemostatic balance towards thrombophilia would be a decrease in the regulatory proteins. And the ones that we're talking about as far as decreased regulatory proteins are things like protein C, protein S, antithrombin. If you look at the classical hemostasis or coagulation pathway here with extrinsic and intrinsic coagulation in the common pathway down here, what's not clear is that the majority of coagulation activation starts through tissue injury with tissue factor and the tissue factor factor 7 complex. Most of the activation of the intrinsic pathway um, is really more artifactual the way that we've set up our assays in the lab, uh, say PTTs. And in vivo, most of the activation actually happens through tissue factor factor 7 to activate factor nine over here. And there is a regulator of tissue factor and seven's activity on factor 10, and it's tissue factor pathway inhibitor. Now, why don't we all measure TFPI levels in the lab in terms of thrombophilia risk? Well, it's largely because it's thought that this is a lethal mutation, that patients with TFPI deficiency probably wouldn't, wouldn't exist. Some of the animal knockout models suggest this. So this is a very, very careful regulator of factor 10 activation uh, by tissue factor and factor 7, such that most of coagulation actually goes this way through 9 and 8 and activating 10 in this direction. So where are the other checks and balances on this system? Well, antithrombin is an immediate acting inhibitor of thrombin and other serine proteases. So not just thrombin as an inhibitor, but inhibiting 10, 9, and to some extent 11 and 12 as well. Protein C and protein S, have, as we've discussed, work to inhibit factor 5 and factor 8 by a proteolytic degradation. And con congenital deficiency of these proteins actually was described much sooner than some of the procoagulant uh, abnormalities like factor 5 and factor um, factor V and prothrombin, antithrombin deficiency was described back in the 1960s. It was one of the first uh, thrombophilic uh, associations. So how does antithrombin work? And it, it's kind of an elegant mechanism, so it's probably worth going through for a minute or so. Antithrombin uh, is a, a protein in the member of the serine protease inhibitor family, or serpin family. And antithrombin has a beta-pleated sheet region, a helical region, and it has a leucine group here that is responsible for binding uh, to the serine proteases, to the serine group. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, antithrombin in its native conformation, this amino acid is pointing downwards, so it, it's not really available for binding to the serine proteases. It requires binding of heparin to this helical region that switches these beta sheets around, moves the protein chains, exposing this group here, 
so that then it's able to bind to the serine protease. When it does so, there's actually a covalent bond bound between the serine protease and the antithrombin. So what you're developing is an inactive, covalently bound complex. So that antithrombin essentially has sacrificed itself uh, to bind to the serine protease. And the one um, buzzword for this type of mechanism is called a substrate suicide inhibition, which I love because essentially, you know, antithrombin has committed suicide by uh, binding to, to factor 10A or thrombin and in inhibiting its activity. You then get a mousetrap-like conformational change in developing these inactive uh, 10A antithrombin complexes or um, thrombin antithrombin complexes, if you will. Now, the beauty of this is that heparin, once it, it's done its task, can dissociate and start this whole process over again. So the one really interesting thing about heparin as an anticoagulant is it's recyclable. It can inhibit you know, this process over and over and over again. Well, you have to, to understand that, you have to look in the body, where is, where is heparin? I mean, you think of heparin as a drug, and we all give it to lots of patients with thrombosis. But heparin is actually a biological um, extract, and heparin is present on endothelial cell surfaces. It's present in a, like a dendritic structure on endothelial cell surfaces, where, what's its job? Its job is to marginalize antithrombin. And much of the antithrombin in your body is actually bound to endothelial cell surfaces where, because it's bound to heparin, is already in this active conformation just waiting for thrombin to be formed. So antithrombin heparin is really one of the very earliest steps in the inhibition of thrombin because it's really right there at the site of thrombin formation. So if the, the heparin is bound to endothelial cells, it has to be recyclable or all your endothelial cells would get coated up you know, with thrombin or 10A. So the complex can leave, leaving heparin to start all over again. And it makes it very useful as an anticoagulant because it does have that property. All right, so back to the endothelial cell surface. We talked about thrombomodulin. Let's co concentrate on uh, protein C and its cofactor, protein S, because protein S, the story with protein S is a little bit more complicated. Uh, protein C is the enzyme. Uh, that converts or co degrades factor V and factor VIII, the cofactor, protein S, doesn't have any uh, <coughs> direct enzymatic activity. It's a cofactor. Both protein C and protein S are vitamin K dependent factors, so the levels go down in patients that are, are taking vitamin K antagonists like warfarin. But protein S also exists uh, in plasma carried around by a carrier protein, one of the complement uh, regulatory protein, C4B binding protein. So the assays that we do for protein S are complicated a little bit by the fact that if we measure functional protein S levels, you're largely measuring the amount of free protein S, because only the free protein S actually has any functional activity to be able to bind to activate a protein C. Total protein S will measure all of this, whether it's bound to the C4B binding protein or not. The other complicated thing about this, and we'll talk a little later about the assays when we talk about some of the cases, uh, the C4B binding protein is an acute phase reactant, and the levels go up with an acute phase response, sometimes shifting the free protein S towards bound protein S and decreasing apparent protein S activity. 